All right, we have a lot to dig into, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and just jump straight in. We can start with you, Raja. I'm curious to know a little bit more about what you prioritize in your decision making, and as we all have been talking about, what role does AI play into all of that? Well, thanks for having me here. So well, let me start with AI. Um, we spend a lot of time with emerging managers, especially seed and pre-seed, and we have a fair bit of you know, relationships on the a series A through D multi-stage uh, firms. So with, with AI, as an LP, one step removed from the action, AI as a technology seems uh, to me a compelling new cycle that's you know, potentially gonna uh, expand TAM for a lot of businesses and have a lot of impact in the long term. But in the short term though, it feels to me that 90% of AI companies might be overvalued and 10% may be undervalued. It's hard to know which one's which and everybody thinks they know. Michelle, I think you might have a slightly different perspective. I know, when we were talking earlier, these two were saying uh, today AI is uninvestable. So I wanna take the counter to that. I think uh, from my perspective, kind of yes and no, there are definitely companies that are overvalued. There's a lot of capital still sloshing in the market. There's FOMO. I'll give a recent example. My team pitched me on a company in the AI um, application services space, 60 days ago, they raised a round at 250 million, and they were asking for a $500 million evaluation. So I'm not really sure what happened in those 60 days, but it gives you a flavor of where we are, even in the early stage. However, if we think that this seismic shift with AI, this platform shift, is on the order of PC, cloud, mobile, the internet, I think we may be undervaluing those companies. There will be extreme value created. There will be disruption. There will be $100 billion companies created. And so at M12, we are playing the game on the field. We are investing in great founders going after really big markets. Mark, what's your take? So you're saying we should invest in Microsoft, right? <laughs> um, no, listen, I'm not bearish. I just, uh, I'm reminded of when mobile first came out and people set up mobile funds. And I don't want to call any firm out, but there was an I uh, fund. And uh, you can I, Google it. <laughs> I just, or Bing it. Or Bing it, there you go. <laughs> I fundamentally don't believe that AI is its own category. AI is everything and it's going to be pervasive in every company. You can't afford not to be investing in AI both as an investor and as uh, startup companies and, and bigger companies. Uh, if you look at the United States, we have 4.1% unemployment, okay? And demographics are not gonna increase in this country over the next 20 plus years, probably ever again. You have declining demographics all across Europe, China, India, you name it. There's almost no place in the world where populations are growing. So unless we have AI, Unless we have robots, we simply are not gonna keep today's standard of living. We need tools like this to allow us to do things like provide healthcare to an aging population that we can't do without AI. So it's all net positive. I just don't think it's its own category. And I just wanna say really quickly, like if you do a seed deal today and you slap AI on it, investors will pay a 44% premium for that lipstick on a pig which is basically orchestration of other people's tools than they will for a mere software company. That's what the problem and that is was, today. That's, that's what makes me nervous as an LP, is a lot of that is you know, happening and that was, makes me nervous. So then zooming out, and I, I would love to hear from each of you on this, what are the criteria that you prioritize when you think about investing, and Raja, for you as an LP, as well as a, as a direct investor as well, what are the things that are really compelling and exciting to you all right now? Well, let me, let me start. I think the way we underwrite a seed or pre-seed manager, we first underwrite the person. What is that person's superpower, uh, unique strength, and are they able to help the company to get from zero to one? That's the main criteria. But at the same time, even, even if you're in the middle of a giant tech cycle and trillions of dollars of value is gonna be created at some point, prices do matter. So when I see a manager where they say, we're in this middle of a tectonic shift in technology, prices don't matter, it's all about finding the right company, then that, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's an immediate no for me, for that manager. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, at M12, we invest in early stage, so that's seed, series A, and B. 
Um, we invest in cybersecurity, we invest in infrastructure, and absolutely believe that the stack um, below these applications we built will be rebuilt for AI. When we look at enterprise applications, we actually have a, a rubric. We call it the four Ds. So we look for companies that have access to proprietary data. They have um, dividends, so that means they're solving a problem that customers will really pay for and value. They have distribution, sustainable distribution, one uh, that can, they can either get through those channel partnerships or have a CAC to LTV that makes sense, and then Delight, which is kind of that user experience that we've heard about uh, throughout kind of the conference. Um, I guess a fifth uh, friend of mine uh, from City Ventures mentioned was DNA, and that really does pervade everything we do is that founder, right? You mentioned kind of that, you know, the person as part of, uh, you know, kind of your investment criteria, uh, us as well, is that founder um, market fit. Venture capitalists are fundamentally lemmings. <laughs> and <laughs> they all fund the same thing and it's all what you're talking about because it really makes for nice cocktail parties. Um, to make money at venture capital, you need edge. And to have edge, you need to invest in something or somebody that very few people actually know or believe in. Not on your own, but you have to be in advance of the market. And the problem is that if you're saying something that's gonna happen three to five years from now, most people look at you like you're weird or a bit strange. So at Upfront, we're based in LA. We know that we don't have edge in the Bay Area. We do invest in the Bay Area, it's about 25% of our investments. But in LA, there's a transformation going on right now because of SpaceX and Anderol and some other hard tech companies because of the heritage of JPL, that there's a lot more hard tech and space oriented companies being built in LA today, a lot more atoms plus, built, uh, plus bits being built in LA today. So we don't put all of our dollars into that, but disproportionately, we're trying to figure out what are the areas of innovation that will be at the Fortune Brainstorm cocktail party five years from today? Got it. All of you have, have mentioned at some point stage. And I'm curious what role the stage that you're investing in impacts how you think about alpha, how you think about edge, how you think about opportunity. Mark, Raja, I know that you've all mentioned beforehand kind of a barbell approach, right? Investing in pre-seed and seed, super early stage, or really late stage growth, right? And focusing a little bit less on everything in between. How do you think about stage and what are you really looking for in terms of the types of founders that you wanna back based on stage? You wanna start? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I would define it a little bit differently. At Upfront, we do have a barbell strategy. Our barbell is seed. We skip the entry point at A and B, and then we come in at C, but I don't do super late stage. That's for okay. people who are really experienced in pre-IPO type companies. That's just not us. So why do we skip the A and B? <clears throat> if you look from 2010 to 2022, so that 12 year gap, the total market in A and B went from 8 billion of total capital avail available, sorry, 9 billion, to 82 billion. Okay, massive increase. And the reason is that great firms in Silicon Valley raised, they used to have $300 million funds and they had $2 billion funds. So they suddenly started, instead of writing three to $5 million checks, writing $30 million checks. And you just gotta pick a lane. You can't compete on someone else's basis. So you either need to raise a $2 billion fund or you need to be a little more disciplined. So our discipline is seed. First money in, three to three and a half million dollar checks. We do 40 per fund, usually about six of those. We've been doing this, by the way, for 28 years. Six of those drive 80% of the returns. And then we let other people do AB. We will do our pro rata. The weird thing is at the C market, two things happen. Either your massive takeoff and whiz, let's say, everyone wants to give you money at any valuation, or suddenly no one cares at all about you. Mm -hmm. And there's some really good companies being built that just nobody cares about, so we're focused also on that. Sorry. Yeah, I'll pick it back up. The way we think about our portfolio, think of an LP, a large LP with multiple asset classes, and the role of VC in that portfolio of asset classes is that VC should, and historically have come, you know, has come with a pretty healthy risk premium, and if you look at the data, and that risk premium is concentrated mostly in the smaller end of the fund size, <laughs> and early stage, that's sort of you know, pre-seed to A, is where most of the alpha is. So because of that, we spend most of our time pre-seed to A. And to Mark's point, I think the way we think about selecting managers is 
you know, I don't want to, you said it, the VCs, you know, <laughs> or money, so I won't say. So what we look for is something um, that is unique. I don't want to say non-consensus, but, but in a way, non-consensus investors where they're not chasing hot deals, but they have some insight or some access to a, 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 a niche sort of, you know, space of the venture market that they're able to see it that nobody else sees. I want to move forward and chat with you all a little bit about exits. Um, it was announced yesterday Sequoia offered to do uh, a major purchase of shares in Stripe. We've talked on stage here at this conference about how the IPO market has slowed down significantly. As capital allocators, how do you all think about exits? Maybe we can start with you, Michelle. What is an optimal exit in 2024 and beyond for your portfolio? Yeah, I think it really depends on you know where you entered, right? So if Mark's entering kind of at the Series C, he's looking at a different multiple, he's looking at a different horizon than if you've your entry point is seed and kind of Series A. We've been around as a fund for for eight years. We've had some phenomenal exits. Companies going you know IPO. Uh, we had a, a number of companies going through kind of the SPAC market. Obviously, we know that uh, you know isn't probably going to return. Um, we've done a lot of analysis on you know, our, our companies uh, and what sort of the M&A you know, market. We heard to also at this conference as well that the M&A market, given that a lot of these companies that uh, are going to need and want these AI native companies, these companies that will help propel um, you know, their uh, business forward and are willing to kind of pay things that are above what would a public market multiple would be. So when we look at kind of what a, a good you know, kind of exit is at you know, kind of that series A and B point, of course we want sort of you know, the 55X, the, the power law, right? That does kind of return the fund. Um, but you know, these days, sometimes even the 2X with uh, an M&A is, um, is where we're at. Let me pick up on that. So I, I looked at exit data for the last 25 years. Median outcome for a venture-backed company is about $90 million. So think about that. $90 million is the median outcome. There's going to be outliers like we, we heard this week. And on the, if, you, if you look at the public market today in the US, US stock market, um, there's only 200 companies that are valued more than a billion. And that's including everything, not just tech. Total. Yeah. Total. So it's exceedingly difficult to produce a multi-billion dollar outcome. So we think about that a lot. If there's a portfolio that, you know, that is so risky, so volatile, that has to hit a multi-billion dollar outcome, mm -hmm. that makes me a little nervous. I want to turn over to the audience in just a moment for audience questions, so start getting those ready. Doubling down on this first, though, how do you all think about secondaries? Listen, the Sequoia deal itself is a secondary deal. Uh, the biggest lie, no, not the biggest, but amongst the biggest lies in venture capital is that we are 10-year funds. They are not 10-year funds. They're 15-year funds. And you can clap. Yeah, that's great. So there's a Jake. My cousin and my brother <laughs> have got them as plants. They clap. Paid to be here. Um, but it is, it isn't true. And there's an illiquidity to our asset class that has caused problems, I think, for institutional investors. So I will tell you, you know that I think it was Warren Buffett who said, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. So starting in 2018, we started looking at just how overvalued the tech markets were. And we started selling little pieces of our portfolios over a five-year period of time. We sold about $1.2 billion. Now, if you raise two to $3 billion funds, that's not a lot of money, but most of our funds are between two to 300 million. So that was like good cash flow sent to LPs. And what it took was us selling 25 to 30% of individual companies that were doing well. And I told LPs, I'm still long, I'm majority long but I'm gonna send you some money at a valuation that's higher than normal. So the figure that I like to quote is if you look at public markets, the history of SaaS companies is they traded about 6.2 times NTM, next 12 month revenue. That's over a 20 year cycle. Over a 10 year cycle, it's 9.6. So that's like the football field of where your exit should come for a normal company. In 2021, public market was 24 and a half, okay? private market 100 times NTM. Now that has already reverted to the means. The public markets are back at 6X. So it really has already reverted to the means. So it, for me, like we were selling from that period. So in 2023, I flipped and I became a buyer. 
and we started buying secondaries. We bought $65 million of secondaries in the last year because suddenly there's all these people who didn't take liquidity in those years that will sell at pretty good discounts. So I think secondary markets are really important to venture, and I think they will mature over the next 10 years as more people learn how to price them. Yeah, I think it shouldn't be a taboo. It's yes. not in private equity, so liquidity is not a passive activity. So unless the money is recirculating in the market, it's gonna be very difficult for the asset class. Yeah. I think it's good portfolio management. Yeah. Questions from the audience. I think we have one over here and one over there. Maybe we'll start over here. Where sure are the panel people? And say your name. Sure. Hey, Mark, Jeremy Bloom, Integrate. Good to see hey, you. Hey, man, good to see you. I'm curious, you mentioned you're less focused on the hype cycle now yeah. and more focused on what we'll be talking about in five years. So what are you seeing and what will we be talking about in five years? Thank you. Uh, so let me say this, which is, uh, in, you know the old saying is being too early is the same as being wrong? <laughs> it's a problem if you invest in what's gonna happen in 10 years. So you really need to be in like a four to five year cycle. And I can't say that I'm right, but we do have an opinion. One of the things we've been investing in is, uh, um, we look at what are the trends in the world, one being deglobalization. And deglobalization, I think, is going to drive a lot of investment. The second thing we're looking at is aging populations and the need to provide health care to aging population. Third thing we're looking at is the impact of AI on industry. And one of the industries we look at is healthcare and how much of an impact that's going to have in like drug discovery and ability to diagnose, OK? We also look with a deglobalization trend on what is that, what specifically is going to happen. So an example. We just invested in an advanced manufacturing company to produce ships in the United States. And when I say that at cocktail parties, believe me, that one more than anyone, people look at me like I'm like crazy. Like, how could you invest in that industry? But the reality is that the South Koreans have already automated shipbuilding, the Chinese have already automated shipbuilding, and over 90% of all welding that happens in the United States is hand welded by human beings in a market where we don't have enough labor. So we're trying to look at what are the macro themes and how can you make investments in that. I think venture investors are a little bit scared of hardware. We, launched, we invested in a satellite company. Uh, a satellite costs historically about $30 million to produce. It's come down to $6 million. We invested in a company called Apex Space that's trying to uh, create standardized manufacturing process to launch a lot more satellites. So that interests us because it's a trend to lower costs, increase manufacturing. Um, what the CEO, he said this publicly so I can repeat it, they get paid about 40% of the price as a down payment before they even start building, and then they get staged milestones. So even though it's hardware, they're not draining cash. There are ways to build businesses that are not cash consumptive. So those are the kinds of things we're looking at. They're weird, I know, and it's uh, less cocktail party friendly. Do we have a question over here? Hey, first of all, thanks so much. Healy Cypher, CEO of Boom Pop and CEO of Atomic, which is a venture studio. Um, oh, what question to ask? Good audience. I'll go with the easy one, maybe. You have so much time to think about what <laughs> I you're know, I know. Ask. I was taking notes. These are amazing <laughs> quotes, you know? Um, so one of the things I've been actually thinking about a bunch is uh, venture as a supply chain, you know, and the seed goes A, A goes B, and kind of onwards <laughs> to uh, IPO. And it feels like the lockdown, a relative lockdown of private equity has been kind of a thorn in the side of the supply chain. Any thoughts on that? Am I right, am I wrong? And, and what does it look like in the next couple of years? You should take sure, it. I'll jump in. Uh, you said lockdown of private equity, right? Um, so here's the weird thing about venture, is it used to be an A round, a B round, a mez round, and then you go public. Yeah. And the A did not do B, the B did not do mez, and then the mez got their profit. When it... We make up letters now. It's like, yeah. it's almost irrelevant. So what was the goal of any exit? It was, uh, when I was young, it was IPO. That's all you wanted to do. Well, IPO market is pretty tough right now. You really have to have phenomenal success to go public, and there will be great companies. The second is M&A. And M&A's kind of been on lockdown for the last three or four years. Sadly, it's probably gonna change uh, starting in January. But uh, we've kind of been on lockdown, well, sad for different reasons. But uh, 
So we've kind of been on lockdown. So that exit environment has largely been challenged. And so, so private equity is going to be, I think, an important exit market for venture capital. But relative valuations of public companies have been better for them because we overvalued venture for so long that we're not realistic on our exit price to private equity. There were 1,200 newly created unicorns in 2021 and 2022 alone. 60% of those were marked by just four firms, SoftBank, Tiger, Coachu, and Insight. So like that market is gonna take five years to work through before private equity gets more interesting. So I think it's gonna be private equity and secondaries probably in three to five years. I think I'll add on to that. I think one thing that I think venture market, especially venture ecosystem, secondaries have been sort of a bad word historically. I think what we need as a, as a venture uh, uh, industry is more emulate private equity where it's okay to, to, for assets to change hands and market, there's data and marketplaces need to be created and hopefully that's what will come out of this cycle. I kind of want to double down on, on this piece around how much has really changed yeah. in the markets in the last three to four years. And maybe this is a question for each of you in your respective firms, but perhaps it's also a personal question, which is what have you all learned about the way you do your work, the way you view opportunities, and how has that shifted in the last three to four years with the ending of the ZERP era, uh, the IPO market and M&A market being what it is. We've seen cycles, of course, with AI, with crypto. What have each of you learned through all of that and how are you viewing the work that you do today? I'll start, I think one thing that's sort of uh, became, becoming apparent to LPs in to, to venture asset class is that there's now multiple products within, within venture. There's early stage products that's different and there's sort of the classic venture, C and A through D, that's sort of a different product, and then growth is, so different LPs and different you know, VCs will sort of self-select into groups, and that's sort of, a, sort of a personal learning for me that you can't evaluate uh, a seed firm in a, using the same metrics as you, you do a large multi-billion dollar um, multi-stage firm. Yeah. For me, I will say scarcity creates clarity. There was a lot of capital that was going uh, to companies, early, early companies that were looking for kind of product market fit. Um, and with a lot of capital, it kind of creates these opportunities to do tons of experimentation, to not be laser focused on getting to that product market fit, to really understanding what the customer needs, wants, will pay for. And so one of the things that we you know, learned, in some cases the hard way, was um, that uh, you know, giving a ton of capital, you know, too early can actually be, uh, in some ways, pretty, you know, kind of detrimental to the company's um, success. I will also personally say uh, that I learned uh, I want to meet founders in person. I think, you know, over the last three years when we were in the, the Zoom era, we made a lot of investments uh, just based on Zoom, and you miss so many cues and by walking the halls, meeting, you know, the extended team in person. Um, so those are kind of two on a personal uh, level. I maybe just want to give an opportunity to talk about what I learned through a big mistake I made, because VCs don't admit to mistakes very often. Um, so. I think early in my venture career, I invested a little too much with ego. And here's what I mean is I would do an investment, it was early stage, I believed in it, and suddenly it would get markups and people would write a $30 million or a $50 million round behind me. And I thought, I did not work on this freaking company for the last three years to have that company own more than me just because they can throw $30 million around. So if I wrote a $3 million check, maybe I wrote five into that round to like maintain my ownership, purely ego. Now the first time I did it, I got an immediate outcome, positive success, sold the company for 700 million, returned $100 million, so I kept doing it. So what happened was the next company I did it on, I doubled down and that company was growing really fast and then it went off a cliff and it ended up going to zero. And I looked back at it and I said, why did I increase my dollar average so much? I already had a great bet and if it worked, I was already gonna make a lot of money. So I try to teach younger partners not to invest with ego. So we say three things on every follow on investment. Do we still believe there's product market fit? Because we invest so early, sometimes we're just wrong. 
about that. So if we don't believe, it's not like we're not going to invest, but we're more cautious. The second thing is, do we still believe we back the best team in the market? Because markets operate on winner take most. And if we didn't back the winner, we should be cautious. Sometimes we were right about the market. Sometimes we were right, we think, about the founder. And then the third thing is, do we believe in this valuation? So if somebody is willing to pay an extreme valuation to be part of this because their business model requires them to write a 50, 70, 500 million dollar check, I don't need to chase that. I already have a position in it. So we will invest at any stage at any amount of money, but we try to have that framework to think so we don't invest so much with ego. Mark, Michelle, Raja, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you. you.